Welcome today to the Manassas Church of the Brethren. It's so great to have you all here worshiping with us today. I have several of announcements to share with you. The first announcement that I have is that today, March 21st at two o'clock, we will be having a scripture chat for everyone who's been reading through the Bible in a year. Whatever plan you're using, I know we've had a plan in the e-news that comes out each week. And so if you've been reading along with us and want to be a part of that conversation, we invite you to our Zoom call this afternoon at two o'clock. And as you continue to read through the scriptures, I always want us to be mindful of these three questions. What is this, what are the words or phrases or images that are coming to mind as I read the scripture passage? What are some questions that come to mind as I read these scripture passage or these scripture passages? And the last question is, what is the scripture passage asking me to do or to be or to change as a result? of this reading. And so we'll be grappling with those questions this afternoon on our scripture chat. The next announcement that I have is that registration has opened for FaithX. What is FaithX, you ask? Well, that is the new name for work camps. And when I say work camps, I know that you know what I'm talking about. There are service trips that are usually provided for our junior high and senior high youth. But FaithX is broadening this opportunity for all generations. And given the restrictions that we have with COVID, um, it's going to be a local opportunity. So we are partnering with the Northern Virginia congregations to offer service daily service projects July 18th through the 23rd. And so each day we're going to travel to a different um, community near a Church of the Brethren here in Northern Virginia, and we'll serve in that community. We'll have a meal together. We'll have devotions together. We'll go home at night. We'll sleep in our own bed. We'll get up the next morning and have a new opportunity to serve in a new community in another Northern Virginia congregation. All of this will be masked and socially distant um, as regulations continue to come out. Um, as the vaccination becomes available to folks. So if you have any questions about this FaithX opportunity, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd love to be able to answer your questions. This is for junior high, senior high, and any high. Any age, as adults, you are welcome to sign up and be a part of FaithX this year. And we would love, love, love to have you participate. Next Sunday, March 28th, we are having an Easter egg hunt here at the church outside on our field. Families can come between two and four, um, sign up ahead of time. So we make sure we have eggs for you and your family. And um, there'll be activity stations set up. And so kids can do crafts and different activities, do the Easter egg hunt and just come and, and be together safely, socially distant outside. At the same time as our Easter egg hunt is going on, we'll have the deacons here at the church um, handing out communion elements. So if you have children or not, it's a great time to come and be together, pick up your communion elements because you're gonna want those for love feast together on April 1st, which is Monday, Thursday. Um, at 7 p.m., we're gonna do a Zoom love feast and everything you need to know to participate with us for this love feast is going to be in your communion elements packet that the deacons will have for you you can pick up that packet on sunday march 28th from two to four or you can pick up the packet on tuesday march 30th from six to seven take a look at your e-news for more information about that and everything you need to know to participate with us for Love Feast. In two weeks, it's gonna be Easter, and I'm so excited. We are going to be able to offer an outdoor, in-person worship service on Easter Sunday. We'll have a sunrise service at 6.30 a.m. up in the picnic area. We will retell the Easter story. We'll spend some time in prayer together. It'll just be a really casual 
worship service together at 6.30, and then we'll come back together at 11 a.m. for a more traditional service, but on the field. So bring lawn chairs, wear masks, we'll stay socially distant. Um, if you are not able to join us in person, then we will be recording that service. It'll be available Facebook Live, and we'll post it to our YouTube channel after the service is done. So many ways to engage in our faith community in these days and weeks ahead. But for now, let us center our minds, center our hearts, center our spirits for this time of worship together. Good morning. Will you join me in the call to worship? How shall we live in the love of God? We will treat one another with fairness and dignity. How shall we witness God's forgiving love? We will reach out to others with compassion. Come, let us worship God who has always loved us. Let our worship of God be reflected in our lives of hope and peace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, here we are. We are your people. As we open our hearts and minds to you, let our words and actions in turn be pleasing to you. Amen. Oh. 
I will be reading from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. I'll be reading from the message version of the Bible. Uh, this is chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Don't run up debts except for the huge debt of love you owe each other. When you love others, you complete what the law has been after all along. The law code, don't sleep with another person's spouse, don't take someone's life, don't take what isn't yours, don't always be wanting what you don't have, and any other don't you can think of, finally adds up to this. Love other people as well as you do yourself. You can't go wrong when you love others. When you add up everything in the law code, the sum total is love. Do you ever have rules at your house? I bet you do. Rules you have to follow at home and probably some rules that you have to follow at school. I know some of you like to ride your bike or your scooter and there's some rules around that too. For some of you guys at home, I sent a message to your parents and I asked them to ask you what rules you have to follow. And I know what those rules are because I have them right here. One of you said, I have to get to all of my Zoom calls on time. That's a rule that you have to follow. Or another one said, I have to wear a bike helmet every time I want to ride my bike. Or my house says there are no shooting video games. Another one of you lives in a house where there's a rule that says you can't take food upstairs to your room. Another rule is don't hit your sister or your brother or don't say bad words. Right, there are these rules that we need to have. And a lot of our rules tell us what we can't do. Don't hit your sister, don't say bad words, don't play any shooting video games, don't ride a bike without a helmet, don't miss any Zoom calls for school. And so my question is, why do you think we have these rules? My guess is that if we are really honest, we know we have to have these rules because they keep us safe. Because somebody in our family loves us so much that they want to keep us safe. They want to help us learn and, and to grow. And I would imagine that some of these rules are important because it's a way for us to love each other to love that sister or brother, to be kind with the words we say. Our scripture reading today tells us that we are full of all of these don't rules. Don't do this, don't do that. And yet they can all be lumped together for this one rule of life, and that is to love one another. So as you think about all the rules that you have, think about it as a way to love one another. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for rules that keep us safe, that help us to grow and to learn. But ultimately, God, we give you thanks for rules that just help us to love one another. Help everything that we do and everything that we say be an act of love. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have a confession. I'm a little bit left-handed. Growing up, I would often reverse the positions of the silverware in setting the table. My dad would simply say, well, you're left-handed. 
I wasn't sure if that was an excuse for not learning the correct positions or some type of disability. During third grade softball games, my turn at bat was always an out until my teacher suggested I stand on the first base side of home plate. Being the only one to stand on that side doesn't matter when you get a hit. When I was teaching, students would occasionally inform me that I was left-handed. I always reacted with shock. Oh my gosh, I am. I once had a student matter-of-factly tell me that being left-handed was a mark of the devil. I have read that being left-handed gives me a different perspective on many things. I do know that I'm in the minority in a right-handed world. I have wondered what my relationship with God and the church would be if our church had a sign that said, no left-handed people allowed. I believe that all of us are created uniquely and special in God's eyes and loved for the people that we are. Our challenge is to say and do things that show our love for God and our neighbors. Let us pray. Lord God, we know you want our best. We confess that we often say and do things that are not loving. Guide us in using our time, talents, and resources. May our offerings be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. God, just as you rescued the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, setting them free to worship and serve you, so you have also rescued us, setting us free from the slavery to sin and selfishness, and inviting us into relationship with you and with one another. We praise you, God, for the love and mercy you have shown toward us. You call us to love and serve you by loving and serving our brothers and sisters, both near and far, to put their needs and interests ahead of our own, and so to fulfill your law of love. And so we offer our prayers for the world you created. God, we pray for those who do not have what they need in order to survive. We pray for those without enough food and water, medical care, shelter, or security. Open our hearts, God, to see the needs in our world and to respond with your love. 
God, we pray for those who are living with serious illness or injury, who face each day with uncertainty or pain, who find themselves wondering what the future holds. God, open our hearts to see the needs of those around us and to respond with your love. God, we pray for those who have no work, who are struggling to provide for their families, and who despair of ever finding employment again. Open our hearts to see the needs of the unemployed and to respond with your love. Gracious God, we also pray for your church, the body of Christ here on earth. We pray that we would be a living example of your love in our world, treating one another with compassion and respect settling differences with love and integrity, bound together by our common allegiance to you. Open our hearts to see one another and to respond with your love. God, we praise you for the way of love that was modeled for us by Jesus Christ. Open our hearts and our lives to your ongoing presence among us so that we might grow in faithfulness and love and bring glory to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In my house, we like to play board games. We've got a stack, uh, several bookshelves actually, that are just full of different kinds of games. Card games, board games, strategy games, action games. And they're games for all ages. And we know that every game we pull off the shelf to play has rules that we have to follow. And that the rules for one game are not the same as the rules for another game. And we know that when we play these games together as a family or with friends, the game isn't as much fun if people aren't following the rules. The game only works when we follow the rules. And we have one particular person in our house, I'm not going to name any names, who really loves rules. And so if we're playing a game and we don't know a rule, and it's not clear in the directions, this beloved member of our household will go online to see if somebody else has had this same question about the game and to see if there's been a consensus on an online forum about the rule of the game and how to play. And every once in a while, the makers of the games themselves will reply with an answer to clarify the rule, to make sure that we play it correctly. And so this beloved member of my house will, will print out the answer, especially if the answer has come from the maker of the game itself, and we'll tuck it into the game box. So the next time we play and we have that question, we've got the answer from the maker to help us. Rules. Some of us are, are rule followers and some of us are rule breakers. Throughout this week, I've had the honor and privilege of attending a workshop, learning about the BRAVE method. It's, a, it's an opportunity to learn a little bit about how to set goals and do strategic planning and some other things related to um, running a business. Of course, we don't run a business. We're here at a church. But, but part of it is the leader of the workshop, when we ask what her number one rule is, she says, there are no rules. So you know, on one hand, you have somebody who will make sure that all the rules are followed and that there's clarification on the rules and expectations are very well defined. And on another hand, you have folks who just say, my number one rule is that there are no 
rules. And I don't know where you fall along the spectrum of being a rule follower, but we know throughout scriptures that God has given us some pretty explicit directions, some pretty direct commandments, some rules to follow. If you've been reading through the Bible in a year with us, especially as in last month when we were getting through Exodus and Leviticus, we became very clear on the rules or asked to follow. And in Psalm, we hear of King David who writes about his love of the law of the Lord. And so then we get into our text today from Romans. The Apostle Paul had a lot of ideas about how it looked, you know, if we truly love God and love the instructions that God gives, we will live into them with God's help. And so the Apostle Paul, you know, talked a lot about how that looked in the first century. And I think his writings can inspire us today to consider how we're going to apply these ancient laws captured in our sacred texts to the world as we know it today. Throughout his letters, Paul wrestles with what to make of the law in light of the grace that we know comes to us through Jesus Christ, through his life and through his death and his resurrection. And he wants to be clear that the early church understands that their actions are not going to be what makes the difference to their salvation. It's going to be the grace of God that does that. Nevertheless, though, what they do does matter. What a person does, does matter. Repeatedly, Paul calls God's people to live in ways authentic to the faith that they profess. He spends a lot of time in Romans grappling with um, following the law and, and doing what we are supposed to do versus what we're not supposed to do. And so when we get to our text from Romans 13, at the heart of Paul's, I guess this whole book is, is really about his Christian ethics. David Bartlett says this, in Romans 1 through 11, it spells out the first part of the commandment, how we love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then Romans 12 through 14 shows the various ways in which we live out the second commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so in these verses that we come to in Romans 13, Paul emphasizes this well-known refrain made clear in Leviticus and by Jesus himself in the giving of the greatest commandment. If there's only one thing that we are to remember about how we are to live, it should be this. It is the law of love. This is the identity marker for us as Christians, what makes us who we are. Was that him? They will know we are Christians by our love. The law of love. And it's really easy to misinterpret this law. Maybe our first inclination is to get wrapped up in a Hollywood or Hallmark movie illustration of this super sweet and unrealistic set of just glorious feelings for the whole world. We treat love as this glorious, lovely emotion, something we're just supposed to feel that makes us all smiley and happy, and we just love everyone. And sometimes this becomes this hypothetical ideal that we can never really achieve. But Paul doesn't mean for it to be this inaccessible, idyllic claim. 
He uses the Greek word agape for love in this passage, which is not the kind of mushy stuff, sense romantic love. Rather, it's a love that's related to doing things for the benefit of another person, an unselfish concern for others, and a willingness to seek the best for them. In Paul's instructions, the law of love, he's calling for love that has tangible signs. It's the difficult task of real love for real people who are met in everyday life, not some theoretical love for humanity as a whole but real love for the real people in our real lives. Because for Paul, love is about an action. It's not just an emotion. Love needs to be a verb. It's the verb for how we live as those who delight in God's law and seek to fulfill it. And right now, in our world, when we see all that is happening in current events, I sometimes wonder if love is what is at stake and how we respond to it will make all the difference. As those of us who believe in the life-changing power of the love of God that we have through Jesus Christ, We have to live like it matters. We have to follow this law of love. And in times when love is threatened or challenged, that becomes all the more reason for us to live into that law of love. In the face of struggle and tragedy, love is what's going to make the difference. Love is what brings us together to be community with each other. And our text, when the message translation, it says you can't go wrong with love. It's no trick we have to figure out. I mean, look around you. Look at the people in your household that you're worshiping with. Look outside your window at the neighbors who might be outside. We know that the people we can see with our eyes are our neighbors. But now I want you to think about another person or another group as far away as you can imagine. Think about a place on this earth that's as far away as you can imagine. And think about the people living in that secluded, far away, it doesn't have to be secluded, just a far away place. Those people are also your neighbors. All of God's children are our neighbors. So wherever we are, there will always be neighbors around. And with them, there will be countless opportunities for us to embody this law of love. I mean, we can do that right here in our own faith community. I think about the ways that we've offered love for some of our youngest members, especially as they've struggled with virtual school and the ways that our deacons have set up a study buddy program to offer words of encouragement. I think about some of our older members who for this past year haven't been able to get out very much. And the ways that we've offered love by birthday parades or drop-by visits or food deliveries. I think about the opportunities for practicing love that abound for our lawmakers our elected officials who right now 
face some really monumental tasks of working together across party lines to address some really critical issues that are facing our nation today. Can you imagine if all of our representatives practice the law of love in their decision making? I've seen the law of love here. As so many of us are gathering food each day during our Lenten season, that we're collecting in order to donate on Easter morning when we'll bring it all to one spot. Or as we get ready in another week, later this week, honestly, to host yet another blood drive with the American Red Cross the ways that we've kept our building open for AA and NA meetings. Those never stopped during this pandemic. Each of these steps of faith have been an act of love, living into the law of love. The law of love is in the responses of Brethren Disaster Ministries or Children's Disaster Services in the ways that they go to places that have been hit by natural disasters and offer rebuilding in those times or childcare needs, even during this pandemic of putting together comfort kits to send to children. This is what fulfilling the law of God looks like. It's not rigid and legalistic, stuffy or boring rules to follow. It's engaging and active. It's alive and it's full. It's love as a verb. In big and small ways, there are moments where you can practice this kind of love, a love of action that actively promotes the well being and good of another person, any other person. When we love our neighbors, we fulfill the most core aspect of the law by which God intends for us to live. I'm a math person, so I kind of love it when things add up just right. I actually have a shirt that says, um, friends added, sorrow subtracted, actually I don't, love multiplied, Sadness divided. I, don't, I actually don't remember what it is. So this is really terrible that I'm telling you all of this. But, but I love math. And prior to becoming a pastor, I was a middle school math teacher. So what I really love about our text from today is this equation that we get at the end. When Paul writes, when you add up everything in the law code, the sum total is love. When you add up everything in the law code, the sum total is love. So as we're grappling with the rules and the laws and how we live in this world and what we're supposed to do and, and not do, ultimately what we hear from Paul is that the sum total is love. And the final question we have to ask ourselves is this. Is what I'm saying loving? Is what I'm doing loving? And if our answer is no, then we really have to take a step back and reflect. And sometimes we might think what we're doing is loving, so then we have to think about it from the perspective of the person who's hearing those words or on the receiving end of those actions. We can't always know or have control over how what we say or what we do is received when we know from our heart it's loving. But we can learn if what we've said has hurt somebody else or what we've done has hurt somebody else and it's an opportunity for us to learn to do better to figure out what it is to love 
not just from our own perspective, but from the person who's receiving the love on the other end. What is most loving to them? Something for us to consider. Our text begins and says, don't run up debts, except for the huge debt of love you owe each other. So this week, when you go out, I want you to go out paying up for all of your debts of love that you owe everyone. And I don't know what that is, but any way that you can show love, show love this week. Amen. As we go from this time of worship, may we go with the law of love ruling in our hearts. Amen. so great having you all here worshiping with us today if you worshiped with us comment below let us know that you are here if there's a way that we can be praying with you this week please let us know that too we look forward to seeing you again next week <laughs>